All right, show of hands, how many of you have ever worked for a really bad leader? Everybody play along, all of our, really, you worked for a really, really bad leader, hands in the eye. Yeah, some of us, some of us may not have worked for a bad leader, but we've observed a bad leader, right? Maybe it was a coach or a teacher or, I don't know, customer service supervisor at the airport, anybody else, right? Um, I've worked for some leaders that I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemy, all right? I mean, it's kind of been that bad. But just, just curious, and, and everybody play along. Um, how many of you are, have worked for a really great leader? Anybody? Just show of hands. Uh, that's, and that's encouraging. The question I want us to answer today, and I want you to just ponder this in your mind, what's the difference? Like if, if you could only boil it down to one single trait that differentiated a great leader from a bad leader, what would you say? What, what's your answer? No matter what your answer is, um, Jesus is going to give us the answer today. And, you know, I I know a a lot of us, you know, especially if you're new to church or, um, you know, you may be new to your faith or not even a follower of Jesus at all today, you you may think, well, gosh, I mean, is is Jesus even, like, qualified to give us the answer on leadership? But he's not like a leadership guru, is he? And I I think the more you study the life of Jesus, you will see that he is the greatest leadership role model of all time, period. And and here's how I could prove it. Name one person in history that's had a bigger impact on our world than the person of Jesus. Who is it? Who would it be? I mean, there's nobody. I mean, do you you realize we keep track of time based on one man when he was born, Jesus, right? I mean, we have B.C. and A.D., before Christ, and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. It's only 2023 because it's 2023 years after Jesus was born. That's how we keep track of time. And historians can change it to B.C.E. and C.E. before common era, and now we're in the common era. But we're only in the common era because of the most uncommon man in human history, right? I mean, that, this is Jesus. His impact is undisputable. I mean, think of this, if you went to Caesar's palace 2,000 years ago, and you were going to place a bet, let's say they were taking bets, and you were going to place a bet, who was going to last? The Roman Empire, maybe the greatest empire this world's ever seen, or a measly Jewish rabbi with 12 inexperienced followers, who would you bet on? And as John Ortberg puts it, isn't it interesting that here we are 2,000 years later, and we still name our kids Mary, John, James, Sarah, and we call our dogs and cats Nero and Caesar. (laughs) I rest my case, right? I mean, that's the impact of Jesus. I mean, even today in the corporate world, if you work in the corporate world or any leadership intensive environment, did you know the best leadership material available today, what so many companies use, did you know it's based on the person of Jesus? Did you know that? Go look this up for yourself. John Maxwell, Ken Blanchard, Peter Drucker, Patrick Lencioni, Max Dupree, all this leadership material, do you know every single one of them is a follower of Jesus and base their leadership material on the person of Jesus? Why? Because leadership principles based on the person of Jesus work, period. And it's amazing how our world keeps ignoring Jesus and his ways. Now, some of you today are thinking this. Well, if we're talking about leadership, I can tune out because I'm not really a leader. And I want you to lean in, all eyes on me. I would correct you today. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You gotta reorient your thing, your thinking on leadership because what is leadership? Leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. And every single person here has influence. Every person. Now, some of us have more influence than others, but every single person has influence, which means what? Leadership isn't just for CEOs or people who have a big time position on the org chart. Leadership is for single moms and stay at home moms and dads. I mean, if you're a single mom or stay at home mom, do you understand the influence you have on your kids? It's unprecedented. I mean, for someone here today, hear this, as someone put it, your greatest contribution in this world may not be something you do, it may be someone you raise. That's the level of leadership you have. 
Now, if you're a teenager or a student here today, and we love our students at CCV, you have influence. You would not believe the influence you have on the, the kids all around you, and you think, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. If you're a teacher or a coach here today, and by the way, we love our teachers and coaches at CCV. We so respect you. Do you understand when people are asked who had the greatest influence on your life, you know how many people raise their hand and say, it was a teacher, it was a coach. Everyone here has leadership, but not everyone is a good leader. And Jesus is going to show us the one single differentiator between good and bad leadership. And Jesus' leadership style is best summarized in one single chapter, in my opinion, in all of Scripture, what happened in Mark chapter 10. That's where we're going to be today. If you want to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 32. But let let me just set the stage so you can understand what's going on in Scripture. Jesus is in the last, like, portion of his life. In, in one week, he is literally going to die. He's in the la- entering the last week of his life. And what Jesus is going to do, think about this, he is turning over all of his leadership. The entire church and all of its leadership will be placed in the hands of 12 disciples he's been pouring his life into. And as we saw a couple weeks ago, these 12 guys are unqualified, right? I mean, they didn't go to Harvard Business School. They don't have a pedigree. Yet Jesus wants to do something so big through their life. And Jesus wants to do something big through your life too. But for the disciples and for some of us, their big hurdle is how they think about leadership. So, Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. It says, they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is entering the the city of Jerusalem. This is going to be the last week of his life. He will be crucified and died. And it says this, with Jesus leading the way. And that's a beautiful picture, that wherever you're going, you better hope Jesus is leading the way, not you. Uh, The uh, verse goes on and says this, again, he took the 12 aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. He's so clear. Watch this, verse 33. We're going to go to Jerusalem, he said. The son of man, he's talking about himself, will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They're going to condemn me to death. They'll hand me over to the Gentiles who are going to mock me, spit on me, flog me, and kill me, and then three days later, I'm gonna rise again. Now, is that clear? Not one single disciple got it. Not one. They're like, what are you talking about? You're not gonna die. You just raised Lazarus from the dead. Is this, is this like a parable trick, Jesus? Okay, you're not gonna die. You're gonna be a king. Why do you think we've been following you? You're going to be a king, and then when you get real powerful and rich, we're going to get some of that. But it sounds like it's getting pretty close, so very next verse, verse 35. Then, at that exact moment when Jesus is like, guys, I'm going to die. Then, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, two of his disciples, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, parents, when your kids come to you and say, uh, mom, dad, um, I'm going to ask you something. I just need you to say yes. <laughs> is it normally good or bad? You know the answer to that, okay? But Jesus kind of plays along, and it says in the next verse, he says, uh, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. Here's what they said. They replied, when you become king, let one of us sit at your right and the other in, at your left in your glory. Like, I know Jesus, like all this uh, flogging and killing and spitting bit, like, we'll probably hang back for that while that all happens and stuff, but like, when you work the miracle and then you become king and you're like super powerful, we want the top two positions on the org chart, okay? I mean, Jesus is so stinking patient with the disciples. And he's patient with us too. Watch what he says next. He says, um, you don't know what you're asking. Can, can you drink my cup? In other words, can, can, do you really know what you're asking? Do you, you want to go where I'm going? you want to be on my right and left? Because Jesus isn't ascending to a throne. Where's he going? He's ascending to a cross. And the people to his right and left will be crucified. Do you know what you're asking? Can you handle it? They answer, oh, we can. We're down with your power and your kingdom and your throne. We want some of that. It, by the way, isn't it amazing that Jesus sometimes doesn't give us what we ask because we have no idea what we're asking. Could you imagine if Jesus gave them what they were asking? They'd be on a cross. 
Which is why I have said this forever. I think I came up with this. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. I got to come up with that. But that's straight truth from the words and the lips of Garth Brooks. All right? Straight truth. Because they, they have no idea what they're asking for. <laughs> Jesus goes on and says this. Jesus said, well, you will drink this cup. And, and, and you know, they, he knows what's going to happen to him later on. But this, then verse 41, it says this. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant. You know what the word indignant means? They were ticked. They were so mad. Now, what were they mad about? They weren't mad that James and John asked. They were mad that they didn't ask first. I mean, Peter's like, wait a second. I'm Peter. I should have the top position on the org chart. Philip's like, well, I was the first disciple. What about me? Judas is like, well, I handle all the money. Shouldn't that put me up somewhere like CFO status or something, you know? Like, what is this? They're all fighting about who is going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom. When Jesus is rolling his eyes, I think he picked the wrong guys. And what he does next, remember they're on a road on the way to Jerusalem. It says in verse 42, Jesus called them all together. And he is gonna have a leadership conference right there with his guys to drill into their minds the most important leadership principle you will ever hear in your life. The difference between good and bad leadership, Jesus is gonna let us in on the secret. He goes on, he said, you you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, and he's just saying, everyone around you that you see leading, you know everyone around you leading, they're like, yep, they go, you know they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Now these two phrases are a little unfamiliar to us, but lord it over and exercise authority over are two compound Greek words Jesus uses that are really powerful, and they both start with the same word, kata. And here's here's what kata means. It means down, to put down. Here's what Jesus is saying. You know, you, you see it all around you, from Caesar to the Senate, to the magistrates, to the local governors we have, to the priests, to the religious system, to the Sanhedrin, every single leader around you, what are they doing? They all have one leadership style. They put everyone else down around them to give themselves all the benefits, all the prestige, all the power, all the resources, all the money. It all goes to them. Everyone's, they put everyone down to serve themselves. And the disciples are like, uh-huh, and that's why we want some of it. What Jesus says next Every single follower of Jesus should memorize these four words. These should be etched in your mind. They should be posted on a mirror somewhere. If you ever want to be a good leader, these should be plaster them on like a three by five in your card, memorize them, drill them into your brain over and over and over again. Jesus says every single leader you see around them, you see how they lead, they put everyone down, it's all about them. Watch what he says next. Not so with you. Can we say that out loud just so it can sink into our hearts today? Let's just contextualize it. All the leadership you see around you right now in our world today. Let's say this out loud. Not so with you. Jesus says there is a different way if you're a follower of Jesus. Don't you ever try to emulate what's going on in our world today. And then he says this, instead. In other words, there is an alternative way to leadership that actually works. He says, whoever wants to be great among you, and I think he may have paused at that moment and looked at all of his disciples and say, did any of you guys want to be great? And two of them had already showed their hand, right, James and John, but then he looks at the others, he goes, you know, I know, I know, but like, come on, let's be honest. And the word great is the Greek word megas. It means to have significance. It means to make a difference with your life. He looks at the disciples and says, how many of you guys want to be great? All their hands shoot up. I want to be great. Now, for you here today, how many of you put your hand up and say, I I want to be great? Anybody? See, some of us don't want to put our hands up, right? We're thinking like, well, it's a trick question. Like, Like, that's a bad thing to want to be great. Lean in. Jesus never, ever said it was bad to want to be great. Ever. 
In fact, Jesus wants you to make a difference with your life. He, he wants you to be great. He wants you to change the world and make a difference in your family and see your company culture change. He wants you to be great. So when he says, disciples, do you want to be great? All their hands are like, boop, me. He says, anyone that wants to be great among you, and here he goes, watch this, watch this, must be your servant. You just, you just feel the tension, right? What? Servant. Jesus, a servant only cares about other people, not themselves. Jesus is like, ding, 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 ding. But servants have to get down and like, they wash dirt off people. They're not about themselves. Jesus says, that's exactly right. And then he goes deeper. He says, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. You want to be great, you want to be first? Now when he says slave, it doesn't mean what we think of like slavery. When he says slave, he means this. A slave is someone whose purpose is determined by their master. And do we have a master? If you're a follower of Jesus, you better believe you have a master. And Jesus says, whoever wants to be great has to be a servant. And the disciples are like, Jesus, no one leads that way around here. Jesus is like, guys, have you been with me the last three years? What have you seen out of me? And this is what he says exactly next. He says, for even the son of man, the son of God, me, I did not come to be served, but to say it out loud, serve and give my life as a ransom for many, everyone. That's it. That is the difference between every great leader you've ever had and every terrible leader you've ever had is someone that came to be served or someone that came to serve. The worst leaders in the world, and you know this, their motives are to be served. And the best leaders in this world, their motives are to serve. This is straight from the words and the role model of Jesus. Anybody else look around at our world today and think there's something deeply wrong with our leaders? <laughs> Somewhere I'm at said, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you better believe there is. This is it. This is it. I was uh, reading a book with my small group last week, and I really pray you're in a small group. It's where all the goodness happens at CCV is with a small group of people that you meet with during the week. And I was with my small group, which I love, and we, we were going through a book together, this book by Ken Blanchard called Lead Like Jesus. It's a very, very powerful book if you ever want to be a good leader. And he just walks through the leadership principles of Jesus. And I've read it before, but I was reading it again, and I got to page 247, and he said something that stopped me in my tracks. I mean, I just went, oh. Here's what he said. I want to read it to you. He said, great leadership is an inside-out job. It begins with the heart question. In other words, there is one question that is in your heart which shows your motives for leading. We have to, we have to understand our motive. What's our motive for leading? Here's the heart question. Are you here to serve or to be served. And I stopped in my tracks, and here's why. I, I just started answering that question for myself. Am I, Ashley, here to serve or to be served? And I'll just be transparent. I'm just gonna give you my honest answer. Here's my answer. There are days I wake up and I wanna serve. I wanna serve, I wanna serve everyone around me. And then there's days I wake up, and very honestly, I want to be served. Anybody else relate with that? I mean, I, I have this thing inside of me that I'm battling at all times. Like, am I here to serve or to be served? And I realize if I ever want my leadership to have a legacy in this world, it has to all be about serving. And I have to squash down this thing inside of me that says I want to be served. I mean, think about it this way. For those of you that are married, who's the hardest person for you to serve? 
You know the answer. The person you love the most is the person you have the hardest time serving. Your spouse. That's sometimes what's wrong with our marriages is we are all about you serve numero uno. But if I give you the microphone today and I had you come on stage and I said, talk about the person in your life that has influenced you the most for the good, I can guarantee you when you got the mic, you would talk about someone that served you. Guarantee it. You would talk about a mom or a dad or a grandparent or aunt or uncle that gave their life, laid down their life for you. You would talk about a teacher. When everyone else was saying, you're not going to amount to anything, that teacher said, don't you believe that? And they, they risked their reputation and their time to invest in you. You talk about a coach who stayed late after practice, saw something in you. You talk about a leader at your workplace that gave you opportunities when you didn't even deserve it, and they just invested in you, and they served you. That's what you would talk about. And when I look at my own life, I think about who, who influenced me the most. I talk about a mom and a dad. that I have a mom and dad that laid down their life. My mom, I can still picture it like it was yesterday. I was standing at a piano as a little kid. My mom was a piano teacher, and she looked up, and she looked at me, and she said, Ashley, I just want to tell you, I think God is going to use your life for something really special. And she laid down her life serving me and showing me who Jesus was. I tell you about two Bible college professors when I was in Bible college that, that after class they'd spent extra time with me because they saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. I tell you about two leaders when I worked at Intel that gave me opportunities and sent me to leadership training and, and just kept pouring into me and, 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 and I, didn't, I didn't deserve it. I tell you about when I first joined the staff at CCV, I never once ever thought I would be a preacher. I was a leader, that's what I did. And a pastor Don one day came to me and he said, I, I think you need to start teaching more often. What? And the year before he left, I was teaching more than him. It's because he was serving. Don't you want to be that kind of leader? I think all of us do, but there's something fighting inside of us. There's two things I want to talk to you about that are fighting inside of us that keep us from being the servant leaders we are called to be as followers of Jesus. Here, here's number one. Number one is just our pride. Our pride fights against this. What is pride? Pride is just thinking of me. Just me thinking of me all the time and how I need to be served. And what is the antidote to pride? We talk about it a lot around here. We talked about it in this series called Achilles a couple years ago. The antidote is humility. And what is humility? Because this gets so misunderstood. What is humility? Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's not like, oh, I'm a loser, I'm nobody. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less and more about serving the people around you. Philippians chapter two, what's it say? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing. Don't be selfish, be humble. Take on the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So what do we have to do if we wanna be servant leaders Servant leaders fight daily to have less pride and more humility. Where are you? Where are you right now? Second thing, and this, this is the harder one to me. For a lot of us, this is going to be harder. It's not the pride that gets in the way of our servant attitude. It's our fear. This is tricky. Think about this. What does fear do? Fear, we have an insecure view of the future resulting in self-protection. And self-protection, when you get into self-protection mode, that is the enemy of serving others. It's the enemy. Now, the, the question is this then. A lot, of us are, a lot of us think this way. We think this. Well, I mean, I mean, let's be realistic. If I serve everyone else, who's going to be looking out for numero uno? Is that a fair question? Like, if I'm just walking around serving everybody else, who's going to care about me? Like, if I serve the way Jesus served, who could ever, ever take care of me? I don't know. The God of the universe that has everything in his control in his hands? Do you see what's at stake? We don't trust God. So what is the antidote to fear? 
It is trusting that God has your back. How much do you trust that God has your back? If you went out and served like crazy, do you think God could take care of you? Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of human opinion disables. I like that. But trusting in God protects you from that. And as a servant leader, I would tell you, trusting God has your back takes the weight of fear off your back. When you trust that God has your future and he can direct your paths and he can open doors of opportunity and leadership and blessing where you can't, it takes the fear off and you move out of self-protection mode into serving mode. But you know what a lot of us need when, when you hear those things? Like, I, gotta, I gotta fight my pride, I gotta fight my fear, and I gotta have radical humility and radical trust to become a servant, a servant leader. You know what many of us need? We need a role model. And Jesus role modeled this for us. That's why you should be in scripture because he role modeled it for us. But you need to see people around you practicing that. And that's the hard part in our world today. Now the good thing about our church is our church attracts a lot of leaders. And we see it as a calling of ours of, of being a leadership intensive environment where you can raise up as a leader and God can use your life to do something great. And we have so many great leaders around here. If you wanna, if you wanna role model, you just ask one of our campus pastors. There's so many great servant leaders around here. But I wanna expose you to one of them today. He, he attends our church, his name is Vern Clark. More accurately, his name is Admiral Vern Clark. He's a four-star admiral that in the year 2000, Admiral Clark became chief of naval operations. That's short for he is the head of the entire U.S. Navy. It's a small job, there's only 800,000 people under his command. I think a budget of around $90 billion. But in the year 2000, when he was appointed as head of the entire Navy, less than 14 months later, 9-11 happened. And as one of the top leaders in the entire country, when the second plane flew into the building, Admiral Clark jumped into action. He's on the phone scrambling jets and getting our military ready in D.C. and New York to protect our country. But the reason I want you to hear from Admiral Vernon Clark is because as I've got to know him, he is one of the most servant-hearted leaders I know. And we can learn from his example, why is he such a servant? Because he's just trying to follow the way of Jesus. You became a leader of leaders in one of the most, um, you know, horrific times in our, our nation. You're helping lead that. When you look back on your life, did you, did you ever think you'd be head of the entire Navy? <laughs> Not a chance in the world. You know my background, but the people listening won't. And um, I didn't go to the Naval Academy. Uh, I went to a small Christian college called Evangel College. I had committed my life to the Lord full scale. Uh, all in. And by the way, you've been talking about all in around here for the last six months at least. <laughs> all in. Yeah. And um, I made that choice. I was 16. Mm -hmm. And also, you talk so much about camps. When you said that you've done the analytics on all of this, when you look at return on investment and you look at the impact that camps have on our young people, mm -hmm. This is an incredible investment for Christians to be thinking about. And I knew that to be true because I was one of those kids hmm. when I was, six, was 16. I was a believer, and something happened in the middle of that. And that night, I got on my knees and I made an all-in commitment to the Lord. But that experience at camp uh, stayed with me. I knew, and my mom and dad had been so specific about this from the time I was a youngster, God has a plan for your life, Vern, and your responsibility is to figure out what that is. Wow. And so uh, that's the way I grew up. Wow. So you enter the Navy, and you're not planning on being there long term, no. but God sees differently. What did, what did you begin to, to observe about different people and how they kind of jockeyed for positions, things like that? Because that happens in every organization. Yeah. When I was a brand new admiral, one star, and I remember social settings, watching the infighting going on with people clawing, trying to claw their way up the ladder. Uh, there was nothing servanthood about the things that, uh, that I saw in most of those circumstances. There were always, though, 
some people who stood out that were different. They understood the requirement to invest in others, uh, to sa sacrificially uh, to invest in the lives of other people. When I look at your career, I think you just kept serving where you're at and God kept opening doors versus you opening them for you. Now tell us about that, because I've heard you talk about opening doors. If you, if you, well, if you want to open your own so doors. So my testimony became, and especially when I'm uh, to talking to faith groups and, and young people, I've been troubled through the years, not watching all young people, not just believers, but young people are being cultured that they have to program every single move in their life to make sure they're going to be successful. At some point, five years and 10 years and 20, and, and for me, 37 years later, I mean, it's not possible to do that. And so my testimony was, look, there is one who knows what those steps are going to be about and what they're going to be. And we can decide as people of faith, as Jesus followers, if we're going to trust that or if we're not. And so my storyline uh, to young people is, okay, you can plan this all out if you want, and I wish you every success in your endeavor. But I spent my life walking through open doors. I didn't walk through closed doors. And so my testimony was, <laughs> you can try opening those closed doors if you want, but I recommend you get the biggest pair of boots you can find because you're going to need them. It really does not play out well versus, hey, serve really well where you're at and let God open the next door Absolutely. for you that you can walk through. How would you maybe describe the difference between um, you know, being a servant leader versus being someone that's just soft and inactive? I have a... I have a little poem style thing. Do you mind if I I'd share love it. it with I'd love you? To, I'd love to hear it. I mean, it's not the, I admired this through the years, and so I thought I would bring it along. The challenge of leadership is to be strong, but not rude, to be kind, but not weak, to be bold, but not bully, to be thoughtful, but not lazy, to be humble but not timid to be proud. Now, you know, Achilles, <laughs> and I would say to be thankful, maybe thankfully proud of what the Lord is helping us do in an organization and growing people, but not arrogant, never arrogant. To have humor, but not folly. Uh, I, that kind of characterizes the way I see the trade-offs and challenges that we face while we're trying to be a, a servant leader, but also understanding that we got to make things happen. Well, I love how you are a perfect example of someone who has really, <laughs> tried, to ser really tried to serve others, and God has just taken you to a place where you're in one of the top leadership positions in our entire country. And I love that you're a part of our church. Um, Why don't, don't you end by, tell us a story about you were in the Pentagon when the plane flew in to the mm -hmm. Pentagon. Yeah. Uh, you lost 42 yep. of, of the people that, that worked for you. Mm -hmm. Two days later, uh, you're in a room, small room, I think it was about eight of you, President of the United States walks in. Uh, tell us what, what he said to you. So it was one of those moments where there was no hello, everybody, how are you kind of things, that there always would be otherwise. Uh, the, t the tension was such you could cut it with a knife. It was an unusual small table, as I recall, three people on each side, max four. He walked in, didn't say howdy doody, turned to Rumsfeld and said, uh, you got an update. And then without any further ado, him just listening, he turned and pointed his finger right at Don Rumsfeld and he said, don't you ever forget what happened yesterday. And then one at a time he went around the table to us. Don't let the events of the day and the press of the day cause you to forget yesterday and what happened. Don't you forget, you forget. Came all the way around. And then he said, I promise you, I will never forget. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for leading our country in such a big way, in such a big moment. I think God positioned you there as a follower of Jesus at that time. 
I would say if, if you were looking at our church today, if you're looking at someone in the audience today and you're gonna tell them something, don't ever forget this, the same way you were told, don't ever forget, what would you tell a Christian today to never forget? Well, I would tell them, never forget the example that Jesus set for us. Jesus showed us how to do this. He showed us what sacrifice was all about and serving was all about. Serving others, growing and developing his disciples as they f followed and teaching them step at a, uh, one step at a time. And then making the ultimate sacrifice for all of us who have come since. And I would suggest that we never forget that for ourselves, but for the example that he shows us, that how it is done, we actually sacrifice, we're willing to sacrifice what it takes uh, for others so that they can be elevated in him. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure always. Thank you for what you do. Pastor. <laughs> we give it up for Admiral Vern Clark. Is, isn't, isn't he an incredible leader? And I want to tell you two things I saw out of him, and you saw it too. Radical humility, radical trust. And this is exactly what Jesus was trying to teach the disciples, is that if we would live from a place of humility and trust, we can serve others radically and change the world. But I don't think Jesus' discussion on the roadside leading to Jerusalem that day, convinced the disciples. It didn't. You know what I think did? I think what happened later that next week. Later on the next week, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and people are declaring him king. Thousands of people are lining the streets. King, king. They walk into Jerusalem later that week. They, they go to an upper room and you, you, you couldn't even imagine the emotion. The disciples are like, we're famous. He's going to be king. We're going to have the top spots in the entire world. All the power, prestige, money, it's all coming our way. Jesus, you're going to declare yourself king? And Jesus doesn't declare himself king. In fact, he does something that makes all of them gasp. He takes off his robe. He puts a towel around his waist. And they gasp as he kneels down and starts to wash every single one of their feet. You could not imagine how radical this was. No leader in human history had ever bent down to wash someone's feet. This is for the lowest of, lowest of servants. It's a nasty job. You know, we're not talking about walking the streets of Phoenix, we're talking that people walk a Roman city with waste and sewage and dung going down the streets. Their feet are filthy. And Jesus walks up to each of them and they say, you're not washing our feet. Peter says that. And he does. Washing 12 people's feet would take a lot of time. And I think it was eerily silent when Jesus was doing it. One by one, he washed the dirt off their feet. He just served them. As he washes their feet, the filth goes into the, the bowl. There's filth on his hands. And one by one, he shows them, this is what I've been telling you to do. He gets up. It's silent. He looks at every single one of his disciples and he says, do you have any idea? Do you understand what I just did for you? It's hitting into their heart. He says this, you call me Lord and Master. In other words, you know I am the most important person in the room. Peter, are you more important than me? No, sir. John, you more important? No. James, if me, your Lord and Master, the Son of God, got on my knees to wash your feet, I want you to go out and I want you to do the same for every one around you. And they did. They did. You want to know why the world changed? Because the disciples served. It happened once, and it can happen again. 
if followers of Jesus today would say, we will not buy in to the leadership around us, we will follow a rabbi named Jesus. And we'll get on our knees in our companies, on our teams, with our kids, with my spouse that I don't really want to serve right now. I will get on my knees and I will serve like Jesus. Because here's what Jesus taught us. Until you learn to bend down to serve, he cannot lift you up to lead. And I pray today that there's a revival and just God does something in your heart. Because I think if we would start serving, that would change our city. It would change our world. Our power, our clever marketing, our buildings, our preaching, those are mere tools. What will change our world is our serving. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? I pray all of us start serving because God will start moving. Let's pray together. Father, I just confess to you my own sin where I, I have wanted to be served. I know it's in me. And yet, Father, I want to strip this thing out. And I just want to be a leader who serves. I do. And I know there's so many people at our church, God, there's followers of Jesus that we just realized today that there, there's too much in our life is, that's about me wanting to be served. Whether it's in, in, our, in our house, whether it's in our company, whether it's with our kids, or whether it's with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, God, there's so many things that get damaged and wrecked when we get prideful and fearful. So Father, would we lead with radical, radical humility and radical trust, and as we bend down to serve, would you lift us up to lead so we can make a difference in our, with our life and make a difference in this world? In Jesus' name, I pray, amen, amen. Hey, have a great week. Go serve somebody.